Here we are. We're live again. Uh, day 11 of the I'm Curious to Know project. Uh, special day yesterday with my wife joining the show uh, for Mother's Day. And today we have a friend and uh, someone I've, I've uh, not been in touch with for a little while, but I'm glad to be able to get back together. Uh, Renee Wirtz, the CEO of 3T Bikes. Renee, how are you doing? Fine, thanks. Yeah. Pleasure to be here. Yeah, it's great to you have you. Here. Yeah, uh, I know that you have had some pretty serious experience over the last little while with with COVID and the impact on um, your hometown where 3T is based, and we'll get into that. But I I want to start with a question I've always wondered. Uh, you had a steady, stable career with Philips. You were climbing the corporate ladder. You had a steady job, and then all of a sudden, you know, early 30s, you decide that you wanted to go to this brand this bike brand uh and and take over and reinvent i want to i want to hear from you what what the hell were you thinking yeah i need to have a 12-year career philip so yeah when i graduated from a business administration i did what most people of my age did is joining a big uh company because the philosophy was big companies offer a lot of growth opportunities and that's partly also true i think but in the beginning of your career so I started to treasury, uh, dealing with money, and then uh, went to consumer electronic division of Philips. I went to, uh, I moved to France, Paris, Nice to join uh, the mobile phone division. And in the mobile phone division was uh, uh, a division where I uh, managed a spin-off of Philips. I got to deal with entrepreneurs uh, that were building a company, uh, and I became uh, the active CEO of the company. And I really enjoyed that phase because it was. People very driven to build their own business, and 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 you know they had a project. They didn't have a job. And uh, after that, I moved on in Philips um, in the semiconductors, and my last job was in uh, corporate merge and acquisitions. And um, uh, during that time, I did an MBA at INSEAD, and uh, a lot of time at this MBA spent on thinking about what you really want with your life. Uh, and although most of my classmates were sponsored had a sponsored MBA from the company. Most people left the job afterwards because uh, I realized for myself that what I enjoy is building something. I like to create and build. I'm not so good in maintaining something. Uh, that's not what I enjoy. So I realized that I am better off, you know, creating and building my own company. So I started first. I tried to launch a online dating company in 2004, which was uh, pretty early on at that stage. Yeah. Um, and um, that didn't succeed because I realized I didn't spend enough uh, the, the right money to get good people on board. Um, so that was also the time when I realized I'm probably better off trying to acquire a small company and, and grow it because I had a lot of international business experience in my, uh, in my 12 years in Philips. <clears throat> so I, uh, I came across in my search for companies. I, I mean, honestly, I looked at acquiring a small boat company in France. I looked at a sailing company, a sail company. Uh, I looked at various options and then I came across 3T. Uh, and what I saw there was, first of all, an industry where people are super passionate about their sport. So people that work in the cycling industry don't have a job. They are passionate about their sport and they love to talk about bikes all the time. Yeah. And I really enjoyed seeing that, seeing like this is this is something I really would like to be involved in. In Born in the Netherlands, I was raised with a bike, obviously. I have one in yeah. Holland, at least one bike, so that came natural fit as well. And also the fact that 3T was a premium brand. And it was, uh, I saw potential in in positioning that, re-bringing -bring, that back, relaunching that as a premium international brand. So I took the opportunity, I acquired the, the trademark, the brand name, and started a company from scratch. And uh, I honestly, the first day I was sitting in my kitchen table after leaving Philips for 12 years, having a company car and a secretary and a pension, a pension fund, etc. Uh, and all these resources, the first day I was sitting at home and thinking, what have I started? <laughs> Where do I start? Yeah. Uh, but uh, so the first thing I did was taking a plane to Asia to try to find some products for my new company with only a logo. Yeah. Um, and um, and since then I've been, you know, first rebuilding the company as a parts company and later on we transitioned to bicycles. And I really enjoyed every moment of it. It hasn't been easy. I mean, it's not easy to be the the driver or something like this, but I really enjoy it because there's no one to blame. 
for if nothing works, it's uh, it's me and my team building the company. And um, yeah, I, I enjoy it a lot to build and also to be involved with people that are so passionate about their sport and and, uh, and uh, you know live. It's it's it's, it's a lifestyle to be involved in, in in this business. I think. Yeah. Now you early on in the company, from what I could gather, really focused on. Um, you know, creating a premium product um, and also getting it in the hands of the right people. So getting it on protein bikes, um, really focusing on those sponsorship arrangements and having it in the right teams. Can you tell me about kind of your tactics or your thoughts about how you went about bringing the business to life and, and getting your product in the, the hands of the right people? Yeah, first of all, I think it's a choice when you build a business, you either be cheaper or you're better than competition, but there's not, not, not much other options. Mm -hmm. uh, and you have people's per some people have a personality to be able to squeeze every cent out of a product. Uh, you know, Ryanair is a good example that is a successful business because people there are just focused on that. That's not what fits with me personally. I'm more of a storyteller creating this uh, premium image and the service around that. So for me, that was a natural choice. It was also where 3T was in the past. 3T. Yep. 3T's founder was a very innovative uh, person. So uh, 3T is actually the most innovative bicycle company from its foundation. So it, I was continuing the DNA of the brand, I would say. Yeah. And um, yeah, I, I at that moment looked very much at, uh, at an example. Uh, Andy Ording founded Zip or took over Zip and grew that uh, successfully. And for me, that was a big example of how he did that. And I took inspiration of that in. Uh, in, in, uh, in growing 3T, I've always looked for, for me, for reference points of people that I think do a great job or I admire or think, uh, you know, have, have a certain areas, a certain expertise, and I try to learn from that. And, uh, and that was, a, that was a, a, one of the examples for me. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, pro tour team and, uh, and getting connected with the right brands. I never wanted to be an OEM brand. I wanted to build 3T as an independent brand. Yeah. Uh, so we chose only a few OEMs with the right brand name to carry the 3T brand into the stores and then be growing aftermarket. And I think we successfully did that yeah. uh, from 2007 onwards. Yeah, it's probably that's probably where a lot of people have seen, you know, the logo on your shirt there and recognize the name of the brand is, you know, handlebars, stems, seat posts, all the things that kind of have come on their bikes. So they probably recognize it, but they may not know or they may not be aware that, uh, you over the last five years or so have now started developing and building and growing your own bikes. Um, tell me about what that, you know, what was that lightning in the bottle moment where you're like, okay, it's time to build bikes. We can do this better. We can do this more premium. We can create a category. Tell me about your thinking process or your thought process around why bringing bikes to market. Well, when, uh, when we relaunched 3T in 2007, we became very quickly very successful. Also helped with the fact that uh, Carlos Sosta won the Tour de France in 2008. I mean, sometimes you have to be lucky, but it was only one time lucky to win the Tour de France, but that was the, the, in the beginning, which had to be very helpful. Yeah. Uh, so we went through, I think, five, six years of tremendous growth. Everything we produced was basically gold. It was flying out of the door. And at a certain point, I think in 2012, 13, we start seeing it was getting harder. And rather than pushing harder, of course, I started first pushing harder. Yeah. Uh, and then I took a step back and realized what is changing. And I realized that what was changing was that bikes were getting more integrated. We were selling in 2008 a lot of forks to frame builders, but all the frame builders started making their own fork, which is logical now being a bike company. I think that is something you would never outsource. So I understand yeah. the move. Then came the integration of the seat post. It became from a standard round on an arrow. Uh, um, she posts that only fits that particular brand name. So you could think about, okay, if it's fork and seat post, then the next thing will be the cockpit, the handlebar and the stem. That's where our core business came from. So I saw that um, uh, our market was going to reduce in size. That was an issue. Yeah. So I thought about, uh, so from a defensive point of view, we needed to go in another direction. But I also thought from an offensive point of view, thinking, hey, we make actually everything of a bike except the frame. So we have the rest all. So that's a lot, right? A lot of frame builders are trying to make the other parts. And that's not so simple uh, as it seems. Uh, but we were only missing the frames. And um, my first customer in 3T was Cervelo, founded by uh, Phil White and uh, Gerard Romer. 
yeah. uh, and they have really helped. Uh, Surveil has really helped uh, to uh, to uh, allow Treaty to take off with uh, with that relationship and the sponsorship and the Carlos Sastre win, of course. Uh, they sold the company in I think 2012. So in 2013, when I realized we wanted to, uh, we needed to go into frame and bike development, uh, I reached out to Girard that I knew from 2007, and uh, he had nothing to do, uh, and he was willing to, uh, you know, to uh, to get back on designing great frames, and he's best frame designer in the industry, I think. And we yep. started talking about him joining uh, the company and then helping transition the company into a bike company. That was the one thing we agreed. And the second thing that we agreed is when he came on board is we want to bring production back in-house. Right. That was the second pillar. The first pillar of chasing the bike company that has already been achieved. We are now 90% of our revenue is coming from bicycles, gravel and road. Uh, and the second pillar of uh, production, uh, we produce our own crank uh, since one half year in-house. And we will start producing our own frames in-house. First only selective models. But I think in a five-year time frame, we really plan to bring, uh, you know, 50% or more of our production in-house. Yep. How long from that initial discussion with Gerard to the first bike kind of prototype rolling off the, off the factory line? What was that process like of creating that first product? Uh, well, the first discussion to to join force and what we wanted to do, uh, uh, I think that took uh, only a few months because we knew each other for already six, seven years. So uh, Gerard joined beginning of 2015. And of course, when he joined, we already had clear what we wanted to do. It was not that he joined first and then we were starting to discuss what the plan was. We agreed yeah. to plan before he joined. Uh, he joined. And then it took uh, 14 months to launch the first bike, which was the Aero Gravel bike, uh, which was... a uh, very exciting moment. I was also very nervous of our first bike. Yep. Uh, the first reactions for the press were also very nervous cracking because they said it's a beautiful bike, but it's a niche of a niche because who needs an aero gravel bike? <laughs> yeah. Uh, but that had turned out to be a, a very great success story. Uh, and um, yeah, I think uh, we are very happy with that change that we made. And uh, uh, the next uh, the next frame took, took shorter to develop it's not just a product change. I think that's important to say as well. By change from parts to bars company, I had to change everything in the company. Yeah. You don't work anymore with the stereos, you work with shops. Uh, so instead of one big shipment, you make a lot of small ones. It's about customer service, which is more technical than, uh, than uh, uh, paperwork. It's yeah. about uh, your marketing is different. Uh, for parts, you, you just need to make studio shots with bikes you really need to be way more active on the on that side so we have changed the entire company uh, yeah. in, in that transition to a bike company yeah it's um yeah that's those things you don't think of right you think that a company has it, it's underway it's doing you know you're doing really well you've you've noticed an opportunity you know just start making bikes it's not that simple um and you mentioned to me you talked about storytelling you talked about this content creation and this marketing I think right from the beginning, you did a really good job of that, of that storytelling and um, romancing the product and showcasing it the way that it's supposed to be used. Uh, you know, in particular with your Expedition 3 trips um, that, that you created. And I had the privilege of, of, of doing one of those and, and kind of writing about that for you guys in Ireland in 2018. And it was a, a real joy. Um, tell me about why that was such an important part of the beginning of the company and show or beginning of you selling and creating and making your own bikes well when we launched explorer there were there were two issues one was that uh how do you market something in a new market <laughs> yeah uh, aero gravel didn't exist so how do you market there if you make a road bike it's very obvious you sponsor a pro tour team you get exposure you get credibility and you sell your bikes yeah so that was one challenge how to what is the marketing vehicle and the second thing is that I realized that we are not selling bikes, but we are selling the experience and the fun of cycling. And I saw our competition all focused on bicycles and the bottom bracket stiffness and God knows whatever. But it became for me all very similar stories from every brand. So we wanted to connect people back to what the point of cycling was, which was to enjoy and have fun and surrounding nature, right? Yeah. So... Um, uh, we had seen those uh, 
early adopters of gravel, there were people that went six, seven, eight, nine weeks or sometimes months to South America to make fantastic trips. And I would love to do that, but I just don't have the time to do that. So we yeah. thought, can we package that experience in a time frame which allows our customers that have all busy jobs to have that same experience? Yeah. And that's where Expedition 3 came up. It's a three-day adventure trip in, a, in, in, in an area which is within two hours flying from where you live. So our goal was to, to have storytelling about how great gravel riding is in areas where our in near areas where our customers were living. And that was important because when gravel started, people were saying, oh, that's an American thing and that doesn't exist everywhere else. So yeah. we wanted to show that it is in the, in the UK, in Spain, in the US, in Canada, in Mexico, everywhere you can find beautiful all, all road trips, road and off-road. Yeah. And it's just so much fun to ride like that. So we start telling those stories. And, uh, and, and well, you enjoyed one of them. And uh, yeah, I mean, your experience is also very positive. I've done travel myself and I'm just, that's my type of cycling. Yeah. I enjoy it. It is strong riding. You need, to, you need to be fit to do that. You see a lot of different areas. You eat well, you enjoy the whole day. Um, yeah. And um, yeah, I think a lot of more people start seeing that, right? I mean, it's now probably the biggest, it's not a niche anymore. It's probably one of the biggest sectors. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like. it definitely is here in the US. So I, w I wonder kind of what the trends you're seeing around the world. And now that it is somewhat of a crowded marketplace, what are the next steps for you guys to continue to stand out with your product offering? Our treaty has always been, uh, well, first of all, in, in terms of the world, it started in the US, Canada, yeah. but it's now in Europe is, uh, is fully on board. Spain, France, Italy, UK, Germany, it's, it's everywhere uh probably two years behind still the us and canada but it's 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 already big in europe in asia it is starting slowly uh and cycling asia is the last part of the three uh, let's say areas in the world uh but also there i see uh there is uh, japan it's starting in korea it's starting very small and slow but it's getting there and i think the more Gravel goes into racing with Dirty Kenza and Bells and Waffle Ride, and we have our Geobomb series around the world. Yeah. The more heroes that are going to create, be created, the more it also will be adapted in Asia. Yeah. Um, and in terms of how do we stay ahead, well, uh, we uh, one of our slogans is be first. So we, uh, as I said, the founder of 3T was a very innovative person. Uh, 3T was the first to use aerospace alloy for, for handlebars and stems. It was the first time to come with an uh, with an trialon specific bar, yep. uh, so that DNA is still in 3T. And Gerard uh, Vrome is obviously a very uh, innovative guy. He's pushing envelope. That's also my nature. So we uh, we constantly find uh, new ideas to be creative, it's not only in the product side but also on the business business side on the marketing side. Uh, and uh, well, stay tuned. But something uh, soon is coming, and uh, you will not be disappointed. We continue yeah. to develop, uh, you know, great bikes. And today, the Explorer is still the fastest gravel bike in the market. Mm -hmm. uh, but, um, yeah, there's always room to improve, right? If, uh, yeah. Yeah. if you wait long enough and you keep thinking creatively, you can find better solutions. Yeah. Now, tell me, you mentioned Jeroboam. I, I love the story of how that created. I love the name behind the series. I love how you guys are expanding that to get more people on bike, get more people to adventure and experience the product, but also have uh, an amazing time with amazing people in beautiful locations. With an asterisk, obviously 2020 is a tough year to do these type of things, but tell me the story about Jeroboam and the name behind that and how that all came to be. Well, we had to, we launched uh, the Explorer, the gravel bike, and we started expedition trips, so that was all going well. Yeah, but what we missed was a kind of an event. In in, uh, in Italy, it's, uh, Grand Fondos are very famous. So road cyclists come together, they race, and then uh, they go home afterwards. So uh, there was the idea from another organization to create a gravel event, and uh, we were asked to become the sponsor because uh, we were recognized as one of the leaders in this category. And uh, I was thinking, yeah, we can sponsor that event, and we will. We are a small company, and if this is a failure, this event. Uh, then we wasted our money. If it's a success, then one of the bigger guys will come in and they will take that position. They will offer more money. So how can we create something more authentic to us, not just giving a, sending money and being a sponsor, 
but how can we create something which is for our customers and for our employees as well? So we are in the north of Italy, very close to the uh, France Corte area, which is where the the Prosecco, the sparkling white wine, is produced. Yeah. Uh, and um, and it's fantastic riding there. It's 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 tough gravel riding there, but it's beautiful. There's lakes, there's mountains, there's uh, all kind of levels of gravel roads. Uh, and uh, we decide why don't we create our own event? Uh, so that we had that idea, and then we think, how do we call this event? Uh, and one of the things was it needs to be very challenging. So we came up with the idea about let's make a 300 kilometer ride. Um, and it happened to be that the three liter wine bottle name is called Jeroboam. So that's why it's called the Jeroboam series yep. uh, after the three liter wine bottle. And we have also the Magnum Ride, which is 150 kilometer, the Standard, which is 75, and the Demi, that is the 37 and a half kilometer. So it's all in line with the size of the, one, the wine bottles. Yeah. We launched Very it in the 70 with the series in Italy. Yeah. And, uh, in the meantime, we have expanded, and this year was actually the great breakthrough. We had uh, Costa Rica, Greece, Dolomites in Italy, our in Francia Corta, Spain, Austria, Switzerland, Japan, all lined up, and everything is postponed or cancelled. So far, it's yeah. postponed, but uh, yeah, that's uh, yeah. But, uh, but we will do it. Otherwise, we will start at the end of the year or next year. But we will create a series where you. You know what to expect in terms of this is this. You know what to expect in terms of uh, inclusive. It's not only for guys. It's for families. It's for men and women. You can bring your kids. There's entertainment. There's food. It's a yeah. weekend, so you can really enjoy the sport with with, with, with a family or with friends. Uh, yeah. For the for the absolute crazy rider, what's a three hundred kilometer? But if you are a beginner, you can do thirty seven and a half and seventy five or one hundred fifty if you're a bit more trained. So it, we offer it for. Everyone, it's includes for people that would like to join the sport. Yeah, it sounds like fun. Uh, I I had it on my bucket list to attend at some point in uh, maybe 2021. Um, yeah. You also, uh, I want to talk about some of the other product offerings you have as well. So the Explorer, as you mentioned, is the Aero gravel bike. Um, you also have the Strata in the lineup. I have some really fond memories of the first time I I rode a Strava, uh, a Strata. Sorry. You had driven from your hometown across the border. You met me in uh, in Schaffhausen in Switzerland, where I was taking on the uh, Tour Tour, which was a 500 kilometer relay ride around Switzerland, a, a tour of Switzerland. Um, you were generous enough to to drop off some bikes for our team, uh, and I have I had a moment in time where I'm riding that bike, looking at the Swiss mountains, and I'm like, this is heaven. This bike is incredible. It's like a rocket ship. Um, I felt on top of the world. So I have very, very fond memories of that first experience of riding the, the Strata and getting to meet you. And we had a great dinner and a great conversation. Um, yeah, so I'll be indebted to you for that. But tell me about that that particular product and and, and what that one's all about as well. Well, the Strata is uh, is an aero road bike. So it's all about speed, right? That's the heritage for the team between uh, a performance brand, always at the you know, high-end side of the market. Yeah. Uh, but uh, it's also about comfort. And I think what we showed with the Strada was that comfort and performance go hand in hand. Um, Strada was the first bike that could run 30 millimeter tires. Uh, and and you start with the tire saying, I want to have comfort on my bike. So I start with a wider tire uh, and then I design the frame around that tire. Uh, and that is how you can get an aerodynamic performance comfort bike. Mm -hmm. uh, what other brands have tried at that time is uh, design a frame and then flipping in some some tires on the putting in some some tires on the wheels and then if you put a 30 millimeter tire in a bike that's designed for 25 millimeter it destroys your aerodynamics. So we start the other way around. We start from the tire. We want comfort. It means wider tires. Then design a frame around it, and we have shown that this is a it is one of the fastest bike ever made yet very comfortable. And that is what everyone that drives that bike confirms it's very fast it's very stiff yet very comfortable you're not uh, you don't need to go uh, laying in your bed for hours to recover from your trip you can actually enjoy after the ride to walk to your table having a good dinner yeah very cool now how uh, you mentioned you know starting from tires and building around that i've always wondered like how do you price a bike how do you determine where you put the the price of the bike the bike in the market like how do you kind of develop those details yeah, that's a difficult question. 
So uh, I think that the, I mean, you have competition, obviously, uh, even though, uh, you know, we think we have a unique bike. Of course, there's competition. You have a customer decides what the competition is, not us. Yeah. If you guys would decide between us and another brand, that is our competitor, whether we like it or not. Uh, so that's, of course, an element to take into consideration. Uh, we also look, of course, at, uh, at the cost. How does it cost to make something? Our products are, we use the best material for our products, so we're never the cheapest. Uh, and it's also the service that we deliver, right? It's, uh, we have to, we want to service our customers in a certain way. So we need to make certain margins to pay for all of that. Uh, and uh, and then I think for us it's also important then with all that consideration that we ask a fair price. We don't want to be a company that's squeezing every dollar out of our customer. We we are definitely not a cheap brand. I realize, that. Uh, but um, we uh, we want to offer a fair price for the effort that we put in and the service that we are giving. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um... It hasn't been without challenges. Let's be frank. Starting a bike brand, starting you know, releasing bikes to the world. There's been some ups and downs. Um, namely, you know, you broken into last year into the factory. Uh, you know, Mission Impossible kind of Ocean's Eleven was how you kind of described it to me at the time, where people came in and basically ransacked and stole a bunch of bikes from the factory. That was kind of one of the things. You know, dealing with COVID and the, the impact on Bergamo and the hometown of Three T. Um, you know, the sponsorship with the the, um, uh, the the road cycling team, the UCI team, uh, you know, and some of the backlash there. So tell me some about the the roller coaster of things that have kind of gone wrong as well um, as you've released these bikes to market. I, I, I told my wife once, I think one day I will write a book about this because, uh, <laughs> and I think it's, it's, it's probably worth reading. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's... Uh, I mean, if you are an entrepreneur, you, you 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 have to build something, and nothing is easy. From the outside, it might look like successful, but there is a lot of energy that goes into this. From myself and Mr. but also from the entire team, right? We are a very pushy team. Uh, you need to push forward, and you need to believe in what you're doing. I think that's maybe even more important. I think that everyone that works in Turkey is believing in a bigger mission than just having a job. And, and that's what you need because there's a lot of things go wrong. <laughs> and, uh, and particularly if you change, make such a big change, uh, because as I said earlier, it's not only a product. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, I think, I think it's, a, it's, a, it's a personal drive to, to want to achieve and to build. I think that motivates me and uh, I, I, I am in for the long run. Yeah. I'm, looking, I'm not looking for a short-term gain, so I'm, I really want to build something sustainable. Uh, and um, yeah, I mean, I have also support around me, my family, but also I'm part of an entrepreneur organization that when when you are those moments where you're down because you have a, a setback number six in that week, that you have people that say, hey, I've been there too, don't worry, everything will be fine. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, two nights of good sleep and, and then we go again. And it's also very important, I realized uh, over time, to look back at successes, right? So so I started alone in my kitchen table. So when we were four people, it was just, ah, I started alone, now we have four. That's a success, right? Or we had only one handlebar, now we have three. Or we had yeah. one cut, now we have five. So it's very important to celebrate successes, even if they're small, particularly in moments where it's difficult, saying, yeah, this did, didn't work, but that worked. Okay, let's focus on the things that didn't work and we also will succeed. Yeah. That persistence, I think, is, uh, is, is key to, yeah. uh, to that change. Yeah, that's a great mindset to have and I think it's really good advice for people um, to follow. Can you pinpoint one, you know, what was the moment in time where you're like, oh, shit, I don't think this is going to work or this is too much of a challenge to overcome or you were just really despondent and maybe it took you a couple, you know, more than two nights to get over. Was there one moment in particular that you can remember? Oh, there have been uh, several, if not many of those. But uh, you, you, you uh, I think every entrepreneur will recognize that if you run a company, your issues are with cash flow, your issues are with people, yeah. good and bad. And, uh, and, and, and that is really difficult. So, uh, you know, you have uh, 
you have uh, deliveries to make to teams and products that don't arrive on time or the plane is cancelled or, or your or your product failed to test. Uh, you have uh, uh, suppliers had to pay, but the customer didn't pay, so they are having a problem over there. Uh, or to have, uh, I've seen in 3T, we had in the beginning, we hired a very good team and then we got bigger. We got uh, people on board that actually didn't fit the culture of the company. Uh, and to have to let them go again, that was in the beginning really difficult too. Yeah. Uh, well, I've, I've all learned how to deal with that, but that remains difficult. But I think there are many, many, many setbacks, many highs and many lows. Uh, and uh, uh, from the highs, you need to get the energy to overcome the lows. Yeah. Uh, but uh, but they always come down to the same thing that uh, it's cash flow or uh, or people people yeah. make company right it's not one person that makes a success yeah yeah great advice again now uh, i want to touch on on the recent uh occurrences you're in the heart of what was at a time the epicenter of COVID 19 in the whole entire world in bergamo italy um you, i had kind of sent you a message sending my thoughts and wishes to you and you'd mentioned how difficult it was you're hearing sirens throughout the night um, you know, there's people you know and love that are in hospital and, and dying and people from the team's family. And it was a really traumatic time. And for you, you had to you had to readjust. You had to pivot. Uh, you decided to take the positive approach and see what you could do to help. Um, what? Tell me about some of those initiatives that you took on, but also how was it being in that part of the world with so much horrible news happening on a constant basis? Yeah, it, it arrived at us in the beginning of March and then it went really quick. So I remember that the first weekend of March on Saturday, my wife went still skiing with the kids. Yeah. And on Sunday, the lockdown started. So the schools were already closed for two weeks at that time, but everything was relaxed. People were still going for on the terrace. It was nice weather, having a drink outside. And on Sunday, the government closed, uh, the, uh, closed everything, the ski lifts, hotels, etc. And then the companies were still open, the shop was still open, but within 10 days, they in, in, in four or five steps, they closed all that down. And after, on Saturday, as I said, we were skiing, we were still very relaxed, but the four or five days later, we started hearing ambulances 24 hours a day, every five minutes passing by my house. So it was really scary. Uh, we had people in the office that had the virus. Uh, I think a week after the lockdown, uh, two people in my office, they lost, uh, one lost their father-in-law, the other one lost, uh, his grandmother. Uh, we had friends where uh, their parents were in the hospital. Um, we have uh, uh, the the person that is also making always making the roots for the Giro in in France Corta is actually a doctor on intensive care. So we heard from him the stories about having to choose between shall I give this patient air or the other one. I mean, these are terrible things to 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 take a decision. So we were really impacted. It was really close. And there was real panic. There was serious panic here that this was going to go completely wrong. And just the fact that streets are empty and the only thing you hear outside is the ambulance passing by all the time, and day and night, that is really scary. I mean, some people compare it with a war situation. I think in war is even worse because you hear bombs and you hear that kind of stuff. We didn't hear, have that, of course, but for the rest, it was quiet outside. Everyone scared and ambulance all the time. And then yeah. the stories about uh, overflown in the uh, hospitals, not enough equipment, uh, building tents outside to take patients in. It was uh, it was really bad. So, um, yeah, what we, uh, we uh, for me, it was, of course, there were two things. There was a human tragedy. I mean, that came really close. And there's also the the business aspect, right? We, we have a company and we have jobs and we have families that are living from that. So uh, I wanted to work on both, both these things. So... Uh, what we did is um, uh, it, we, we were told three days before that we had to close as a company. Uh, we, uh, with, uh, with one guy in the office, we packed as much good bikes as we could. We put them on a pallet in the truck to Denmark yeah. because a lot of Europe was much less impacted. Uh, so everyone moved home, working from home, and our products moved to Denmark. So we continue to support our customers from there. Um, that, was, uh, that was a good move in hindsight. Uh, I remember standing in the warehouse and the other guy said, Rene, do you really think this is worth it? I said, we know we just try it. Otherwise, we just wasted three days, but maybe, it's, uh, maybe it works. And luckily, it worked. Denmark remained open and we could support all Northern Europe. And then um, 
yeah, we had uh, all our customers were sitting home. They couldn't ride outside. So we wanted to come up with something to keep them going. Uh, to, I think it's important as a company that you also vibrate positivism to, 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 to the community, but also to your customers. So we came up with this bundle together with Elite. Elite was very kind to, to provide uh, trainers at cost price and they could sell them for full price because everyone was wanted, looking for trainers. They gave us trainers. We combined it with the bike and sold that at cost price to customers. And from every bundle, we uh, donated 500 euro to the hospital in Bergamoort because they were really in need to for masks and everything else. Yeah. And then after that, I thought, yeah, we are young, dynamic team, sporty people. There must be something we can do more than just raising money. Yeah. And we just started a year and a half before the factory uh, in our building where we produce cranks. So uh, I discussed with the, uh, the head of the engineering team. They're saying, what is it that we can use this equipment we have here? What can we use it for, for, for breathing equipment? Because at that moment, there was a shortage of uh, ventilators. Yeah. Two engineers in Italy had invented, uh, had figured out that the Decathlon diving mask could be transformed into a ventilator. But for, in order to do it, they needed uh, several tubes. And over the weekend, we figured out that we could produce that. So on Friday, Saturday morning, I figured out that this was an opportunity. The engineer thought about it in the weekend, and on Monday, we produced the first tubes for that. And I think that was, uh, everyone was in the office was very proud that we did that because people are seeing we are not just standing at the, at the sidelines. We were yeah. impacted. All our, uh, you know, everyone knows someone that passed away or is in the hospital, and we tried to help. And and I think that was that was very positive also for the staff to continue to work. Right, I work in a company that does something more than just shipping bikes and trying to make money. Yeah. Um. Yeah, and then later our Taiwan team got involved. They started raising money in Taiwan and sent over a couple of thousand masks, which I donated to the community and the hospital here. And later on, when we had produced enough of the ventilator tubes, we started making uh, facial masks or protective gear for uh, for people in uh, at the reception of a hospital, for example. They were not getting any protection, yep. but they, they meet a lot of people, right? So we made, together with 10 other companies, we made those uh, protective gears. Yep. And then last Monday, we could open again. So we actually have been very busy in those two months, uh, both keeping the company going which is also important, uh, but also to try to uh, contribute to the to our community. And uh, yeah, and last Monday we uh, we celebrated the opening uh, with a uh, special explorer dish. You might have a look at the website, but that is uh, yeah. in uh, Harlequino is the uh, is a Harlequin and he's uh, with a very colorful jacket, and he was actually wearing a mask. But he has a very colorful ca character, ups and downs, and he has a. We made an, uh, a bike with his colors, and we uh, we uh, someone can win that bike. But this was yeah. to celebrate positive reopening of the company. Yeah, yeah, brilliant. I I applaud you for the way that you were able to transition and and help and support. And you know, as you say, the first goal is keep the company alive, keep people in jobs where you can, and uh, and then once that's kind of secured and and uh, underway you can then look at how can you adapt and change and support the community that you live in i have seen the bike i'm very uh I, I i would love to win it myself and if anyone wants to read a little bit about the story of what you guys took on during this time uh on your website is a great story you can log your email address in there and 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 win this harlequin bike which also includes i think the first cranks that you read that you built after you reopened and re re uh, calibrated to be able to create the cranks as well Correct. Yeah, that's a very symbolic bike for us. So it's a yeah. very there's a monetary value to the bike, but this is a very important emotional connection to that bike for everyone in the office. So this is a real yeah. big thing we give away. Yeah. yeah, it's beautiful. It's a beautiful bike. Uh, someone will be lucky to, and I'm sure, are very happy to win that one. Um, yeah. This has been a great conversation. I've loved kind of learning a little bit more about the company and how you know you got got things going again and reinvented and, and repurposed yourself along the way and the challenges and the roller coaster of emotions and um you know you've done a great job of sharing that story um so i appreciate i appreciate you being here um as always i, I like to finish with three questions um i'd love to get your perspective because a lot of the guests have been 
US base. We did have one, uh, Till Schenk, who's a friend of mine. He was in Girona, Spain. So he went through a, a quarantine and lockdown period similar to what you guys did. But uh, I'm interested to hear your answers to these questions. So I'll start with the first one. Um, what's one thing that's changed for you during this quarantine lockdown period uh, that you want to make sure you keep once we reopen and we go back to the new normal? Well, I think two things, one private and one uh, work requires privately is uh, I used to travel a lot and be a lot away from home. And in this period, I've been every, every evening home for dinner. We had dinner with the children yeah. and that is actually fantastic experience. Simple things are what makes me happy. I've also realized. And so one week we can bike again and I enjoy it so much that I, I knew it already, but I enjoy it so much that it has more value now for me than before. Yeah. So uh, just the simple things that make you happy. Yeah. And I think in the uh, in, in work wise, uh, I have seen that we have a very committed team that when when the team and the company needed them, they were there in difficult situations, work from home with all the family sitting at the same table. So I'm very proud with the team we have on board. And I know that we can really rely on them when, when we need and, and not not only me, but, but the colleagues and the community can rely on the team we have in our three offices in the world. Yeah, great answers. Um, second question, uh, what's one thing you thought was important before lockdown and quarantine uh, that you're happy to leave in the past? Traveling. <laughs> I did not miss the airport. <laughs> and actually, I'm very happy that I am uh, not in a plane. And yeah. I never well, use flying a lot. And that is also for me personally, but also in Bergamo, which is uh, one of the most polluted areas in uh, in northern, uh, sorry, in in, in, uh, in Italy, in, in Europe even, because there's a lot of production here. The yeah. sky is so clean here. The blue, the blue sky is bluer than ever. The yeah. smell of air is much better. So now I know what it means to live in a clean environment, and that's really worthwhile. Yeah, that's so, uh, beautiful. Yeah, I love to contribute to that. I'm happy to do that. To do so. I like that one. I. Um, Follow-up question to that in regards to the not traveling. I'm sure that now you're kind of getting in a bit of a rhythm where your people are working apart, you're working away from, you know, from the office and from the factory. Do you think that's something you'll keep where maybe it won't be as much in-person meeting, maybe you can continue to connect, you know, over technology? Is that something you'll look to continue to implement? Definitely. I think, I think when you used to fly in Europe for an hour meeting to Paris back and forth in one day, I think very soon people say, are you crazy? Yeah. It's a waste of your time and it's a polluting crazy. So there will be flying. It's necessary to connect with your team. But I think there's a lot of things you can do yeah. over over Zoom, Skype or whatever till you're using. Yeah. Uh, so I think there will definitely be, uh, there will be a change in the way we work. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, positive change too. I like your idea and the pollution and the blue sky and being out of like it's just these meaningful things that you do, you didn't we didn't think about these things before. It wasn't yeah. something we cared about, and now a lot of you know the the answers I've received have been there's quite a few people talking about that how they can see the mountains near where they live now, or they can see the blue sky or the water or what have you. So it's yeah, it's it's really meaningful. Yeah, it's definitely is. Yeah. Um. Final question, uh, what's been the most memorable moment? What's the most joyous moment you've had during during quarantine, during lockdown? Uh, playing games with my children in the evening after dinner. Monopoly, Risk, I have played in the last two months a lot of games and it's only 20, 30 minutes. Yeah. But those times where you connect with your children are, are incredible. And I didn't use, I was not used to do that, so. Yeah, uh, yeah, and we did that because we want to give a positive mood to the children, and uh, but actually make myself also very happy. So, who's yeah. the uh, who's the Monopoly champion in the family? It's my daughter. <laughs> yeah, she's the she's the businesswoman of the future, then, right? Yeah, well, happy to lose if she's happy. <laughs> oh, I love it, um, Ray. This has been great. I really appreciate your time. I know it's late there. Um, I've always loved our conversations. I've always loved our meetings. I'm I'm looking forward to a glass of wine and uh, and some nice dinner together and a and a ride sometime in the future. Sounds very good. Yeah, I want it. <laughs> we do that. Oh. Yeah, look forward time. to it.
All the best. Thanks, Renee. We'll chat soon. Thank you. Okay. Bye. -bye.